Good morning. I'm not supposed to start yet. I don't know where I'm going. Night swim. Good job. Inside joke. You got to love it. Good morning. Beautiful morning out there today. We got even some, uh, we call that like when water falls from the sky, like the clouds and the water. Oh, rain. We had some rain this morning, so I'm thankful for that. Here's where we're going. We have a lot to cover. We have a busy morning. Uh, I can do it, I think. Uh, busy morning. Uh, but here's what I want to do before I uh, kind of go into what I believe, I pray desperately that God has uh, put on my heart to remind us. Uh, I'm convicted about this. I thought about it for a while. I talked to some trusted colleagues uh, and decided that we're going to pull the trigger on this. And I'm sorry because I, I promise you I know how much money it costs to go to school here and so on, but I cannot get out of my head. I'm asking this. I'm asking this week for us as a community to raise $3,750. We have five days to do that, and I'm not some, you know, God didn't meet the goal. It, it's just I'm asking us to raise money for water filters for our friends down in Haiti. Most of you know that Hurricane, uh, imagine that, Hurricane Matt ran through Haiti uh, a week or so ago and absolutely devastated most of that country, or certainly the southern part of that country. So I'm asking us, we're going to work with an organization called Friends and Family Community, Friends and, anyway, an organization that we've worked with many times. I trust them. I wouldn't ask a nickel of you if I didn't know exactly where it was going to go. We are going to deliver those. I can't go. I wish I could. i got to go to Columbia. But they're going to deliver those on November 4th. Every, I, can, I will bring up, I'll put it on I'll sh a full accounting of every nickel that we bring in, and every cent of that will go to these water filters that we're going to deliver, hand deliver. My goal is that if we could, if we raise 37.50, that would buy, there's 75 each. Pythagoras here says that's 50 filters that we would be able to buy. If we raise more, great. There's plenty of things that we could do with it. But I'm asking you today, I'm putting it out there. I'm a little nervous. I'm not going to do that. Uh, that, that crud about give up a cup of coffee. You're, you're adults. Don't, don't, I'm not going to do that to you. You know what you can give. And if you can, I'm asking you to give. You can go into the Center for Student Action today, starting right after this. We already have a restricted line set up. It will be fully accounted for. You can go into the Center anytime this week. On Wednesday and Friday of this week, we'll be collecting money here and on East uh, on, uh, uh, at the doors on your way out. If you are giving money to somewhere else, I don't want your nickel. I don't want anything from you. If you are committed to giving money to a ministry within your church or your family or something like that, there's enough money on the planet. God knows what he's doing. But I am compelled to put in front of us as a step, as an action step, Mr. Faith in Action, I'm asking us to see if we can't raise $3,750 by the end of Friday that we will translate into these water filters, okay? I put it out there. I'm nervous to do it because you're already mad at me. And what a way to start off a chapel. I'm asking you for money. Uh, I promise you it's not for me. Uh, and it will go. Cholera killed 10,000 people. Cholera alone, which you get from drinking bad water, 10,000 people alone after the earthquake in Haiti a few years ago. That's all I'm asking us to do. Okay? Done. It's Global Engagement Week, which uh, you might guess excites me. I've been all over the world, and I am fascinated by God's heart for the nations. What I'm going to try to do by God's grace in the next whatever I have now, 27 minutes or something like that, I want us to walk from Genesis to Revelation. It's not as bad as it sounds. I want us to begin to see if we can't get the biggest possible picture of how God views the world, how God sees all people, and maybe, even more importantly, what then the responsibility that we as Christ followers, how we need to see the world. I believe that there is a clear thread from Genesis to Revelation that shows God's heart for all people. I believe that the theme of the Bible, if you broke it down to one theme, the theme of the Bible is God redeeming all men and women back to himself. And I believe that God is asking those of you and I who are Christians to join him to make sure that there are people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language worshiping around the throne someday. 
I believe that that is biblical. I believe that it is the best picture of God's heart. And in the 26 minutes that I have, I don't know what else to do but point you at Global Engagement Week to point you to what I believe God clearly says about the nations and why they matter and why they should matter to us. And it starts right here, Genesis chapter 1. This is the first time that we can tell, best that we can tell, this is the first time that God spoke to humankind, okay? There are smarter people than me, but recorded, best that we can tell, this is the first thing that God said to Adam and Eve. Uh, and it's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. The first thing that God said to humankind, of all the things that he could choose to say, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth, spread out. Why does that matter, do you think? It's a rhetorical question. We don't have time for a discussion because I believe to populate the earth physically, God is populating the earth spiritually. He had, he had from the beginning of time, and you will, still, you will see soon, that he has a vision that there would be a worldwide, pe that people all around the world would be worshiping the one true living God. By Genesis chapter 3, we know that things are not going well. By Genesis chapter 8, we know that things are so out of control that God creates, he starts all over. He floods the earth. You remember the story? I don't need to tell it to you. He floods the earth. Noah and his family and all of the animals, fascinating, we'll talk about that another day, but it gets all of the animals on the ark. The ark now stops. It stopped raining. Listen to the first thing that God says to Noah and his family. Now, best we can tell, the only people on the earth, okay, if we're reading it right, these are, the new, these are the people on the earth. The first thing that God says to them is this. It's in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. Sound familiar? Noah, I want you to spread out. I don't want you to just stay here. I want you to spread out and fill the earth. We get the sense that this, this must really matter to God for some reason that we can't quite see yet. Does the earth get filled? And I got to tell you, it doesn't yet. And we know that because of a, of, of a story. Some of you know it well. We find out that God has to do something else. And it's in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now the whole world had, a common had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. They must have loved it there. They all looked the same. They didn't have any differences they had to argue about. They all had the same language. They were what? They were comfortable. And I'd like to pick on them, right, because I'm a screw-up, and I'd like to look back and say, why wouldn't you guys listen? God made it so clear. The problem is I can't do that because I have a mirror at my house, and the problem is I see myself sometimes in that. How many times have I said, God, I know what you want to do, and I know what your word says, but, but, but I got this. I can figure it out. Whole nother story, but I have a hard time judging them too strongly, but the point is they didn't want to spread out because they were comfortable. Things were easy there for them. Instead of getting angry, God does something very, very purposeful, and it's found in Genesis chapter 11, 7, and 8. You see this? We're trying to make this progression. I promise it goes faster soon. We're only in Genesis. We'll get there, okay? Genesis 11, 7, 8 says this, come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. Every people group, every ethnic group, every what we call a nation in some form today, all people groups stemmed from that singular event. Most scholars will tell us about 70 languages were started there when you break down the tribes and so on. And now we know, of course, that that has progressed even more all around the world. But it was that singular event where God finally says, it matters so much to me that you spread out that I'm going to force you to do it. Now people are all spread around the world. They're moving their way around, and you say, well, if God wants to redeem all men and women, he just made things harder on himself. Then what? Now, you, now they don't speak the same language. Now they're all spread out. That is a logical human question that I've asked myself for a long, long time. 
until I came across this. God does something that changes the course of history forever. He creates a nation of his own. And we see that account in Genesis chapter 12, 1, 2, and 3. The Lord said to Abram, uh, his name is Abraham, his name is Abram. It's the same person. Don't, it's not a spelling. Don't get worried. It doesn't matter. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all of the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Hey, Abraham, I want you to leave. I want you to leave your mates. I want you to leave your hometown. I want you to leave the motorcycle that you can't wait to ride every single day when you get home. I want you to leave. I can't help but ask you and me in just in a se- for a second here, what if God were asking you to do that? I believe there are some people in this room, and I know this because many of you come up to me often saying, I just feel like God wants me to do something, and I don't know how, or I'm afraid to step out. What if God were asking you to just leave for a season, to trust in such a way that you would do exactly what you believe that he said? Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 is my favorite verse in the Bible, some of the most powerful scripture, partly because it's super short. Genesis chapter 12, 4 says this, so Abram left. You see no argument, you see no whatabouts, you see no, I don't know if I can handle this. The next thing we see is so Abram left as the Lord had told him. He finally leaves. Man finally listens to God. Abraham is now headed out to establish a nation of its own. It's critically important that you see, I didn't print them for you today, but all of you with your Bibles, okay, whatever. Later, go to Genesis chapter 26. You need to understand how this progression goes. In 26, the same promise is made to Abraham's son Isaac. In in chapter 28, the same promise is made to Isaac's son Jacob. This matters in just a minute because you have to see how succeeding generations got that same blessing and that same covenant and that same responsibility because it ends up with you and I in a minute. The rest of the Old Testament is is filled with uh, accounts of God using Israel to make God's name famous so that everybody on the planet now was watching what this new nation and their God was doing. The parting of the Red Sea, the wisdom of Solomon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den. Those are all accounts of how God stepped in and did miraculous things so that many of the kings and others around the world were watching that. And in many cases, they said, wow, who is that God? We're in the New Testament now. That wasn't bad. We transition to the New Testament, and things continue. Now Christ, God in flesh, enters the scene, and we get to see what his life and ministry is like a little bit. And at the end of the day, can I paraphrase it for you, it's some version of he still wanted to reach all people. The goal of Jesus was to spread out. The goal of the commands, in just a second, you're going to see them, and you've got to decide what you're going to do with them as it took me a long, long time to get serious about him. But when you begin to see then when Jesus now is on the planet, what are some of the things that we see? Whether it's taking the long way home to reach the Samaritan woman or healing Gentiles when he wasn't supposed to so that all of the people watching him would know that everyone matters to Jesus. Christ in the New Testament maintained that same pattern that God established in the Old Testament. Here's just a couple of examples because we don't have a ton of time. And the first is this. I love this. It's, uh, did I write it down? I pray I did. It's Luke chapter 4, 20, 42 and 43. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The, uh, the people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, he tried to keep them from leaving. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. There again, even his mates, even those who were following him did the same thing. Jesus, just hang with us. We're comfortable. We know who you are. Don't worry about everybody else. Let's stick around right here. Jesus said, absolutely not. That is not who I am, and that is not why I was sent. Some of you are studying eschatology right now. That's your whole game. That's your your love to understand the end times and what that's looking like. 
So uh, do something with this one. I believe that the world clock, if you will, is to some degree set on this idea of, of making sure that everybody gets a chance to understand who Jesus is. And I read this here. I don't think I'm taking it out of an inaccurate pericope, but I'm giving it to you to deal with. Matthew 24, 14 says this, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to a few nations, and then the end will come. Nope. And this gospel will be preached in the whole world to all nations, and then the end will come. Every person created in the image of God matters so much that I'm going to take as long as it takes to make sure that those people get a chance to hear who I am. If they want to reject, that's one thing. But to have not a chance to hear it all is a whole other ballgame, and I believe that the world clock is set on that. And then we get to the mandate. We get to the last thing that these were Jesus' last words to you and I. Okay, we call it the Great Commission. There's a Matthew 28 version. I wrote down the Matthew, uh, the uh, Mark 16 version because it's quicker. Mark 16, 15. We call this the Great Commission. It's Jesus saying, "All right, you ready? Here's it. Bottom line. He said to them, "Go into all the world and preach the news to all creation." The, the book of Acts is the story of, the, expa uh, of uh, the, uh, the expansion of the early church and how the gospel does, in fact, begin to spread out. And it starts with something that Jesus said. We read it in Acts chapter 1, but it's actually something that Jesus said when he was still hanging with his disciples. And it's at, we read it in Acts 1.8, and it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and where? To the ends of the earth. As the persecution of Christians begins in, Ch in Acts chapter 8, now they begin to scatter out of necessity again. They're getting killed here, 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 and here, so let's spread out and start a new group over here. Let's spread out and start a new group over here. Do you see this theme? I can't help my four eyes. It, it leaps out at me, and it didn't for many, many years. But now I see this theme, the intentionality of how God is using you and I eventually to spread out. The rest of the Acts and the Epistles give a detailed description of Paul and the rest of the missionary band struggling and facing persecution to raise up churches all over the world. So what, Browning? Neat, you kind of created the, a, little, a little bit of a thread here. But we have to see then this conclusion because I believe that those events that took place matter to what God is describing, what we understand heaven to look like someday. And those of us who love, we, we are Christians, we are Christ followers, part of the reason that we became believers is because we want to have eternal life with the living God in heaven someday. What does that picture look like? And it's in Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the lamb. I think I have the one about raving, raising palm branches and so on, but they're all worshiping God. Hear me closely. Listen, listen. Where's the camera? East campus. Listen closely. I believe that this is a promise. I don't believe that this is a wouldn't that be nice. I think we read it in scripture and it is put there because I think that's what God sees and I believe that it's a promise. And if it's a promise, I believe that in fact it will happen. It's not a wouldn't it be nice, it will happen. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes trying to tell you exactly how it can and will happen. It's important to connect what is happening here, this, this scripture in Revelation, and what God started in Genesis chapter 12 in the, in the life of Abraham. He will do it. There will be a representative of every tribe, tongue, nation, and language worshiping at his feet someday. Heaven is multicultural. God is a missionary God. From cover to cover, he is trying to show us what that mission is. Because of that, here's some so what, now what. Because of that, you can't leave today without realizing that there are 16,500 distinct people groups on the planet. I'll show you the research another day. I'll show you the referencing another day. Uh, about 6,700 of those are what we call unreached or least reached, meaning they have no access to the gospel. That represents about 3.1 billion souls. What does that mean for me and you? Browning, you're laying it on me heavy. I can't help it. I just can't live with myself if I don't tell you what I believe to be true. If I'm wrong, no harm, no foul, right? 
the scales fell off of my eyes years ago when I realized the gravity of what this means. God had a bigger, person, bigger purpose in mind for you when he saved you than just rescuing you from an eternal separation. He saved you to use you for his purpose set out from the beginning of time. You are the great connection. Remember when God promised Abraham that his descendants would be a blessing to all nations? If you are a Christ follower, if you are a, purpose, a, a, a person of the cross, because of the line of Jesus through David, you are in the adopted family of God, and you are in the family business of the living God. And that business is God's desire and hard work to redeem all men and women back to himself, to have people represented from every people group. We are responsible for the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, the plan that God made to use his people to make sure everyone gets a chance to hear of the saving knowledge. We are part of that covenant. Remember I told you how generation after generation, it absolutely lands at the corner of Citrus and Alasta and the believers here on campus. We have to realize that. Your life is no longer your own. I wish that we would have told you that before we had you walk down the, the fire pit from Hume Lake and wh whatever you did, wherever you became a Christian. I'm not sure that we told you how to count the cost very well. Some of that's my fault. I was a youth pastor, and I didn't know this stuff, quite frankly. I didn't realize the gravity of this stuff. You have been bought with a price, and the one that bought you gets to decide how to use your life for his glory. I have to tell you this, I believe that there is no such thing as a calling to cross-cultural missions. I think that if you're a Christian, if you're in the family of God, you have some responsibility to do that. I do believe that some people are uniquely called and have a unique passion to live in a unique place around the world or do something right here in Azusa. You have a unique talent and a gift to do that. But for you to somehow say, I can just wash my hands and do whatever I want, I have no skin in this game, is just not true. Because you are a Christian, you have the same responsibility. There is no such call. You don't get to say, that's not my part. That's only for somebody over there. God's hope, is, God's hope and love is for everyone and to everyone. Don't fall into the trap that God wants you to only care for your neighbor. And now here's where you're going to write me the dirty messages. And go ahead, mbrowning.epu.edu, write me all you want. You're going to say, oh, Browning doesn't care about my neighbor. If you knew my heart, I'm telling you that's not the point. But we have this mentality oftentimes that this is my mission, but this is where I, I need to care for my neighbor. The gospel need, the whole gospel needs to get to the whole world period. Where did we come up with this idea that we should share the love of Jesus with those only physically closest to us? Of course we're not going to ignore our neighbor, but what about the 3.1 billion souls created in the image of God that will never hear because they don't have a neighbor that they can talk to about Jesus? How dare we be so ethnocentric and follow such simple human logic? It doesn't make sense to me. You can't swing a dead cat and not hit a church in North America. For the most part, people that are not Christians in America is not for the fact that they don't have a chance to hear about who Jesus is, as opposed to the three billion who don't have a Christian neighbor for hundreds of miles in any direction. I have seen them, countless countries around the world. Jesus' last words, you read them, go into all nations. Jesus' last words did not say, go to the places that are the easiest or cheapest for you to reach with my love. He said to go to every corner and gather people that I have already purchased with my life from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We're not going to find every tribe, tongue, and nation around the corner in Azusa or Glendora or Los Angeles. We are going to have to to take difficult steps and what? Spread out. I am convinced and convicted that the 3.1 billion souls are just as important as my neighbor, period. And I cannot ignore them. I cannot ignore them. 
Don't fall into another trap, one trap that I, and I hear it from you, and I said it for years. I'm not a punk. I was you. I am you. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I fell into this trap a ton. Well, this is my mission field. These are my neighbors. I need to take care of them because this is where God has placed me. I believe that is a trap. I believe another, word, another one of those is some version of this. We don't actually need to go and tell unreached people who Jesus is because a loving God would not let them spend eternity separated from God just because they haven't heard them, haven't heard of him. You've said it. I've heard some of you say it. I just don't think that a loving God would allow those people to perish just because they didn't get a chance to hear. And I believed that for a long time, and I still want to believe that because that's a beautiful picture of the loving God. The problem is, friends, he did find a way. (laughs) We want to say God couldn't find a way. He did find a way, and it's me, and it's you, and it's other Christians actually working hard, being strategic, spending time and money to make sure that those people get a chance to hear. We are the connection. I also believe that we have to stop arguing over a, a social gospel view of God's world and an evangelistic view of God's work around the world. There cannot be any separation There is a remarkable correlation between the most desperate living conditions around the world and the places that are the least evangelized. When the hope of Jesus shows up in a country or a culture, things change. We can see it all throughout throughout the world. The lost are the poor, and the poor are the lost. The good news of Jesus is made manifest in both word and action. We need to take the whole gospel to the whole world. The whole gospel says that we are all sinners but can have eternal life with faith in Jesus. The whole gospel says to treat those that are different from us with great respect. The whole gospel says to heal the sick and the broken in the name of Jesus. The whole gospel says to welcome the stranger. The whole gospel says that we have to go way out of our way to make the name of Jesus known to those who don't know his transformational love. The whole gospel says God sees value in both the preacher and the prisoner. The whole gospel says we must get angry and take action over the fact that millions of girls around the world today still cannot go to school. The whole gospel says none of us deserve the cruelty or the grace that we give each other. The whole gospel says that sympathy is not a substitute for service. The whole gospel says care for the widow and the orphan, the eternal fate of their souls and their hungry, unclean water drinking trafficked bodies. The whole gospel says pray for the person on the trolley next to you and pray for those in countries that you have never even heard of. The whole gospel says stop talking and start acting. My prayer for you this week, my prayer for you this week is that you would begin to realize maybe in a new way, maybe you knew all of this stuff and you're a smarter person than I ever was until just a matter of 10, 11 years ago in the back of a taxi cab in Beijing, China, where I truly believe that God revealed something that I should have known for a long, long time. My prayer for you is that you will realize the gravity and the importance of understanding God's heart for the nations. I ask you to use this week. Find five minutes somewhere. I wish I could give you time, right? That's the one thing we just cannot give. Find five weeks, five weeks, find five minutes sometime this week to ask, how, ask God, how can you use my unique contribution to do what you're already doing around the world? Consider going on an action team, not to go and solve all the problems, but just to live with people that are very, very different than you. It's a form of scattering out. Go on an action team. Run to the office right now and sign up for an action team to go and see what's going on around the world. Maybe go study in South Africa so that you can understand how forgiveness can work in incredible ways when it's it's given a chance. Decide that you are committed to the will of God. Some of you are working so hard to find exactly what God would have you do, and I'm here to tell you today that when you understand the will of God is to do something about spreading out and gathering people so that they get a chance to know who Jesus is, if you will commit yourself to that, if you are committed to the will of God, you cannot miss it. 
Take the pressure off of yourself right now. Some of you are beating yourselves up. I know I should do something, but I don't know what God wants me to do. You take one step forward and, said, God, and say, God, how would you, will you use my life? And I promise you, if you are committed to the will of God, you cannot miss it. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that um, you stepped into our lives and did make a way. Somebody chose to share the gospel with us because they loved us. Help us to realize the responsibility that we have to care for all of the people that you have created around the world. I pray in the name of Jesus that October 17, 2016 might be a day in someone's life in this room where they are gripped with a bigger picture of you and your world. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.